I would like to open the class on a rather personal note. In front of me is a book. The book is in a pretty bad shape. I don't feel bad about it because it only shows that I've been using the book very well over the decades. The book is the collected poems of W. B. Yeats. I bought the book when I was doing my degree. It is one of my dearest worldly possessions. I have written the date of the purchase of the book on its title page and also the place from which I bought it. When I was doing my degree, I suffered from a sort of obsession with AIDS. I thought that AIDS was the greatest poet the world has ever seen. Today, I would like to curb my exuberance and state that W.B. AIDS is one of the great poets the world has ever seen. Why is AIDS a great poet? This is a question I have posed to my students repeatedly and also try to get answers from them repeatedly. Yeats is a great poet for reasons which are perfectly clear. Three reasons to be specific. Quantity, quality and variety. Quantity, the sheer bulk of the corpus of W.B. Yeats is impressive. The particular edition that I have in front of me runs into 565 pages. There is no doubt that when it comes to quantity, when it comes to bulk, Yeats is certainly a great poet. But bulk by itself, quantity by itself, will not suffice. In the case of Yeats, there is remarkably even quality. I repeat, remarkably even quality. You have great poets who write pages and pages of utterly unreadable verse. William Wordsworth, for example. But I dare you, I dare you to show me even one page of mediocre poetry written by Yeats. It was simply impossible for Yeats to write not so, even not so good poetry. So great was his dedication. Yeats threw himself, body and soul, into his verse. And you must remember that Yeats had no career except that of a poet, and a starving poet at that. T.S. Eliot worked as a clerk in a bank and later as an executive of a publishing firm. It said, no career, no life, except the writing of poetry. And every poem would go through dozens of drafts, would take days and weeks to reach its final shape. So you have quantity, 
even quality. And finally, you have variety. Yeats was a poet who constantly changed, evolved, developed, experimented. And there is immense variety in the corpus of W.B. Yeats. The early Yeats is something of a pre-Raphaelite. The final Yeats is something of a modernist. In the case of some great poets, I don't want to name them. We are unable to pinpoint the reasons for saying why they are great. But in the case of AIDS, we have very clear reasons, very solid reasons for saying that he is one of the greatest poets, one of the greatest poets who ever wrote in the English language. I would like to approach the subject of W.B. Yeats, of the greatness of W.B. Yeats as a poet from a different angle. Without exaggeration, I can state that W.B. Yeats was capable of generating poetry from innumerable facets of life, from innumerable facets of experience, from almost all facets of experience of life. I don't want to deliver a lecture on the subject, but I shall make my point clear by giving a few examples. Yeats could convert his private life into passionate poetry. W.B. Yeats is arguably the greatest, arguably the greatest love poet the world has ever seen because he spent an entire lifetime dedicating love poems and fabulous love poems at that to one woman, Montgon. Yeats could draw inspiration from mythology, from Irish mythology and create glorious poetry. The figures of Irish mythology come alive in the poetry of Yeats. Yeats could choose an incident, a trivial incident a seemingly insignificant incident, a routine incident from his life, such as the inspection visit to a school and generate amazing poetry about it, as, for instance, in among school children. Yeats was a gifted nature poet. If any poet can be called the Wordsworth of Ireland, it is certainly W.B. Yeats. Yeats could, could choose a spot in Ireland, in Sligo, Maybe a spot in the shadow of Ben Bulben. Ben Bulben is a rock formation in Sligo. Is a spectacular rock formation in Sligo. Yeats could choose a spot in the shade of Ben Bulben, in the shadow of Ben Bulben, in Sligo. 
and write moving poetry about it. There is a poem of AIDS titled Towards Break of Day. Towards Break of Day. And there are lines in that poem which I cannot read, which I cannot recite without tears coming to my eyes. I must have recited the lines at least a dozen times in class and I must also have cried at least a dozen times in class and my students must have thought that I was, that I am a crazy guy and perhaps they're right. This is what age says in Towards Break of Day. I quote from memory. I thought there is a waterfall upon Ben Bulben's side that all my childhood counted dear were I to travel far and wide I could not find a thing so dear and good. Whenever I recite these lines, I am reminded of my ancestral village and I find my eyes becoming moist. Yates could take an historic event and write brilliant poetry about it. And this precisely is what he does in Easter 1916. Yeats could purchase a tower house. In fact, he purchased a tower house built in the 15th century. I think it was in 1916 that he bought it or maybe 1917 and converted it into a rather uncomfortable residence, a spectacular but rather uncomfortable residence and write with gusto about it. He was very proud of his Norman Tower, Norman Tower House, which he considered his country retreat. In fact, one of the most important uh, collections of WBH is titled The Tower. I have been speaking for quite some time on the greatness of WBH and I think I better try to take a close look at the poem and the poem is, of course, Easter 1916. We can begin with the title of the poem. The title obviously refers to the rebellion that took place in Ireland during Easter week 1916 against British rule. The aim of the insurrection was the establishment of an Irish Republic. In fact, the rebels proclaimed the establishment of the Irish Republic. The rebels believed that as Britain was engaged in the First World War, 
it was the opportune moment for them to seize power and to put an end to put an end to british rule the rising began on easter monday april the 24th 1916 a few hundred rebels a few hundred poorly armed and mostly untrained rebels captured the city center of dublin including the general post office and proclaimed the end of british rule and proclaimed the irish republic heavily outnumbered and heavily outarmed the revolutionaries were forced to surrender on saturday april the 29th 1916 thus the rebellion lasted only 6 days 16 of the ring leaders 16 of the ring leaders were executed were shot 3500 persons were taken prisoner and thus the easter rising ended in catastrophe easter is one of the oldest and one of the most important festivals of the christian churches and it is celebrated in april on various days by various churches easter celebrates the resurrection of jesus christ i think uh, it is possible to apply this aspect to the title of the poem because the easter rising was responsible for a sort of resurrection of the nationalist nationalist struggle of ireland was responsible for reviving the fortunes of the movement of the irish for freedom from british rule easter 1916 thus celebrates thus immortalizes an event which took place during easter week of 1916 during the easter week of 1916 and also an event which was a sort of easter which was a sort of resurrection for the nationalist struggle or ireland yeats wrote the poem between may and september 1916 he started writing the poem in may and completed it only in september that was the way with aids he took a lot of time to write his poems and his poems usually usually went through innumerable drafts it was the poem was privately printed and it took something like 4 years for aids to allow the publication of the poem probably the poet thought that the poem dealt with a sensitive 
issue, a topical issue, and did not want to entangle himself in unnecessary controversies. And so he delayed the publication of the poem by something like four years. What was the what was the attitude? What was the approach of W. B. Yeats towards the freedom struggle of Ireland? Of course, as an Irishman, Yeats wanted freedom for Ireland. At the same time, he, he rejected violence. He did not accept the path of violence towards the gaining of freedom for Ireland. Yeats was not Catholic. The majority of the Irish were Catholic. Yeats was Protestant. Though by the time the poet was born, the family had become middle class. The family boasted of vague aristocratic origins. In fact, it can be said that the family was part of the Protestant ascendancy, the Protestant ascendancy, the domination of social, political, economic, cultural life, the domination of the social, political, economic, cultural life of Ireland between the 17th and the early 20th centuries by Protestants of English extraction, by Anglo-Irish Protestants. So it is understandable, even natural, that Yeats was unable to identify himself absolutely and unconditionally with the nationalist struggle of Ireland. In fact, the poet had to face severe criticism and scathing controversy because of this rather nuanced attitude towards the freedom struggle of Ireland. The poem has a rather low-key beginning, a rather modest beginning. It's a typical Aetian gambit. Look at the title of the poem, Easter 1916. Unless you know the context, there is nothing great about the title. Easter comes year after year. Easter comes every year. And except in the Irish context, the Easter of 1916 has no special significance. Easter, as I said, is one of the oldest and one of the most important festivals of the Christian churches. It was to begin with a pagan festival. In fact, Christmas was also a pagan festival. Easter was a pagan festival and like Christmas, it was a pagan festival which was reshaped into a Christian festival. So Easter 1916, very ordinary title, no pyrotechnics, no attempt to knock the reader off his balance. No fireworks, 
No attempt to capture the attention of the reader. I have met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among grey, 18th century houses. A beginning with which is a perfect continuation of the title of the poem. A beginning which is as low key as the title. I have met them at close of day. The poet presents a very subjective experience, a first person narrative, looks at the whole thing from a very personal angle. I have met them. Who are they? We will come to know who they are as the poem progresses. I have met them at close of day. I used to meet them in the evenings. Coming with vivid faces, vivid, full of passion. Because they are the freedom fighters. They are the revolutionaries. They are the rebels. They were passionate about their cause. And their passion was writ large on their faces. They were, they lived for the freedom of Ireland and they were prepared to die for the freedom of Ireland, which precisely was what some of them did. From counter or desk among grey 18th century houses, Counter and desk. Counter is a table. Flat. The, a flat surface over which business is conducted in a shop or a bank. Desk. Desk is a writing table. From counter or desk among grey 18th century houses. Can you identify anything important regarding the relationship between the speaker and them. They are the revolutionaries. They are the rebels. We will come to know of it later. I think we can safely state that the opening lines of the poem reflect the attitude of the speaker towards the revolutionaries. Counter and desk. They are associated. Counter or desk. Counter and desk are associated with the middle class. And W.B. Yeats was famously contemptuous of the middle class. As I said, Aids himself belonged to the middle class, but his family could boast of vague aristocratic roots, and he always identified himself with the aristocrats. And what about the revolutionaries? They seem to come from very middle class backgrounds. I think that is what the poet is trying to suggest through the opening lines. Not much of identification, not much of empathy between the speaker and the revolutionaries. The speaker is an aristocrat, at least he pretends to be an aristocrat. And the revolutionaries, they are pure middle class. I think that the lines that follow magnify, magnify the impact generated by the opening lines. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite meaningless words or have lingered a, lingered a while and said polite meaningless words. The poet makes it clear that 
it was a sort of high by relationship the the poet saw them as friends perhaps but as high by friends he would nod his head on seeing them he would acknowledge their presence or at the most he would utter polite meaningless words how do you do hope you're fine it's a long time since we have met of course the poet does not mean what he says they are meaningless words they are polite words they are meaningless words or have lingered a while stayed a while sometimes he would spend some time with them but even then he would utter he would say only polite meaningless words it was a perfect high by relationship and thought before i had done of a mocking tale or a jibe to please a companion around the fire at the club jibe jibe is a remark an insulting remark a provocative remark you say something to tease someone mock make fun of or the poet and 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 these people they would exchange provocative remarks insulting remarks the poet would make fun of them mock them tease them to please a companion around the fire at a club the club is the united arts club of dublin it was one of its founding members it was founded it was founded in 1907 it aims at promoting the nine arts in ireland and the nine arts include literature painting drawing music and it was one of the favorite haunts of yeats it is in the heart of georgian dublin and it was one of the favorite haunts of yeats yeats was an habitual yeats was an habitual of the united arts club of dublin being certain that they and i but lived where motley is worn how can we interpret these lines this is the interpretation that i have if you have a better interpretation you are most welcome to share it with me share it with all who are interested in the poem being certain being sure that they and i the revolutionaries and myself the rebels and myself but lived where motley is born what is motley motley is multi colored dress motley is the multi colored dress that is worn by the joker by the clown the poet was certain that he was living in an unheroic age in an age of clowns in an age of jesters he looked around and saw none except clowns around him it was so unfortunate that was what he thought because he was doomed to live in an age of clowns being certain that they and i but lived where mokley is worn all changed changed utterly a terrible beauty is born but now everything has been changed all changed the poets 
assumptions, the poet's assessments of the world in which he lived have been radically revamped, all changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. The poet feels that a fabulous beauty is born. But it is not merely a fabulous beauty, it is also a terrible beauty. Why terrible beauty? It's a sort of oxymoron. An oxymoron is a figure of speech in which the two parts of the figure of speech contradict each other. A terrible beauty is born. By the time we conclude reading the poem, you will certainly get a better understanding of the concept of terrible beauty that Aids speaks of in the last line at the opening stanza of Easter 1916. I would like to spend a few more minutes on the word motley. Motley is the multicolored dress worn by the professional joker, by the jester, by the clown. But motley can also mean incongruous group, group of disparate elements, contradiction ridden group, and certainly in 1916, Ireland was a group of disparate elements. And there was tremendous antagonism among the elements. Perhaps this was what was in the mind of the poet when he wrote the line. Ireland was a boiling cauldron, a boiling cauldron of disparate elements. One wonders whether the word motley indirectly refers to the theatre, because it is in the theatre that we come across the jester, the clown, the buffoon who wears motley. Is it an allusion to the work that the poet was doing in the staging of plays, in the writing of dramas in the establishment of the Abbey Theatre. Or maybe, or maybe there is a subtle allusion to the comic tradition of the stage Irishman in English plays. The stage Irishman, a stock character in English plays, who is a caricature of everything Irish, and it is a caricature seen through conventional English eyes. I would like to bring to your attention the complete refusal on the part of the speaker to identify himself with the subject. The, the, the speaker categorically refuses to identify himself with them. What does the speaker say? You must remember that the language of the first answer of the poem is very 
matter of fact, very conversational. Nothing, nothing flowery. This is not the pre-Raphaelite age. This is not the romantic age. Using conversational rhythms, using everyday speech, the poet conveys his refusal to identify himself with the participants in the Easter uprising, with them who, as the stanzas unfold, we understand, we realize, are the participants in the Easter uprising. What does the poet say? That he used to make snarky comments about them. Snarky comments about them. What does the poet say? That he used to say sarcastic things about them in order to please a companion of his in the club. You must understand that W.B. Yeats was one of the founders of the United Arts Club of Dublin and it was a rather elitist establishment a rather snooty establishment, a rather exclusive establishment. And in order to please a companion at the club, the poet says snarky things about them. A total, a complete, a categorical refusal on the part of the poet to identify himself even slightly with them. Do you know where AIDS was? in the Easter of 1916, where AIDS was when the uprising broke out. He was in London, enjoying the company of Montgomery. And what did he do? Did he rush to Ireland? Did he rush to Dublin? Did he declare that he wanted to participate in the uprising? Did he proclaim that he was ready to lay down his life for the sake of the cause, the freedom of Ireland? Now, Yeats remained in London. Yeats decided to stay put in London and continue to enjoy the company of Montgomery. I would like to read to you a sentence from a letter that AIDS wrote at that time from London to his sister Elizabeth, whom he called Lolly. This is a sentence which teachers often quote while trying to explain the opening stanza of Easter 1916. Because the passage gives you a very clear picture of the state of the poet's mind at that time. This is what AIDS writes, and I quote, there is nothing to be done but to do one's work and write letters." Unquote. I shall repeat the sentence. There is nothing to be done but to do one's work and write letters. When we move from the opening stanza to the second stanza, we experience 
a narrowing down of the focus of the speaker. In the opening stanza, the speaker speaks about them. I have met them at close of day. That's how the opening line goes. But in the second stanza, he decides to name the important participants in the uprising and to discuss what he feels about them. Let me read the let me read the first few lines of the second stanza. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. What voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she rode to Harriers. The first leader of the uprising that the poet discusses is Constance, Constance Gore Booth, daughter of the Arctic explorer and landowner and adventurer Sir Henry Gore Booth, 5th Baronet, Constance and her sister Eva were friends, were childhood friends of AIDS and their spectacular country seat, Lissadal House, was a sort of holiday retreat for the poet. Sir Henry Gower Booth was an immensely wealthy landowner and the Gower Booth estate was spread over 39 square miles that is something like 100 square kilometers in the middle of the estate was the fabulous mansion Lissadal House which commanded stunning views of Ben Bulban. The Gourbooth sisters both strikingly beautiful were childhood friends of AIDS and also patrons of the young poet. It is interesting that the very first description of a leader of the uprising is that of a woman and a rich woman, an aristocratic woman at that. I am reminded of what W. H. Auden says in the second part of his elegy in memory of W. B. Yeats, the parish of rich women, the parish of rich women. It was widely believed in Sligo that the young Yeats, the young poet was half in love with Constance as well as her sister Eva. W.B. Yeats did not approve of extremist politics and this disapproval becomes clear, is clearly expressed in the lines under consideration. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill. 
the poet accepts that her intentions were good. Constance Gerbuth, who after her marriage to a Polish count, Count Marque, which came to be known as Countess Constance Gerbuth, had excellent intentions, but she was ignorant. She was foolish. She did not realize that good intentions by themselves are not sufficient. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill. Her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. She spent her nights attending meetings of revolutionaries, shouting, uh, taking part in them, expressing her opinions very loudly, shouting, becoming a part of very un, how shall I put it, un-aristocratic meetings where most of the participants were working class or at least they were middle class. Almost all of them were not, almost all of them were not aristocrats, except of course the countess. The story goes that in one of the early meetings she attended, she went to the meeting straight after attending a ball in Dublin Castle, the seat of the British administration of Ireland, and that she arrived at the meeting of the revolutionaries in a ball gown and a diamond tiara to the shock of the other participants in the meeting of the revolutionaries. What voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she rode to harriers. Harriers are hounds used in hunting, a particular breed of hounds used in hunting. In her youth, Constance Gorbuth was a stunning beauty, was a heroine of the chase, was very good at hunting. These are activities which um, uh, WB AIDS very much appreciates. Hunting, uh, a, a favorite pastime of the aristocrats. The poet says that the voice of Constance was very sweet when she was young, but after she involved herself in politics, it grew shrill. The point that the poet wants to make is that counter, the countess, the countess ruined her life by involving herself in politics. In fact, this is a sort of stock theme of AIDS. He disapproved of extremist politics and he disapproved very much of beautiful aristocratic women taking part in extreme, extremist politics. He says the same about Margon. Countess Markiewicz was the most important woman leader of the uprising. She was captured and she would have been executed but for the fact that she was a woman. Instead, she was given imprisonment. In later life, the countess became a member of parliament and a cabinet minister. I would like to bring into conjunction with the lines under consideration the not so well known poem of W.B. Yeats in memory of Eva Gorbuth and Korn Markiewicz, which is about the two stunningly beautiful Gorbuth sisters. The poem laments the destruction of the beauty of the sisters, the beauty which had entranced the poet as a young man and throws light on the futility of extremist politics. Let us move 
to the next two lines. This man had kept a school and rode or winged horse. The lines refer to Patrick Pierce. If any one person can be seen as the embodiment of the rebellion, it is Patrick Pierce. Patrick Pierce was the son of a prosperous stone mason. He came from a middle class background. He was only partly Irish, but he decided to dedicate his life to the freedom of Ireland and to the revival and to the revival of the Irish language. The story goes that at the age of 10, Patrick Pierce used to kneel on his bed every night and pray to God to give him an opportunity to lay down his life for Ireland. Patrick Pierce founded a school for educating children in not only English but also Irish. That is why the poet says, This man had kept a school and rode our winged horse. The winged horse is of course Pegasus, symbolizing divine inspiration. Patrick Pierce was a lover of books, a great scholar, a gifted literary artist. Today, there are numerous streets, roads, parks, buildings, institutions all over Ireland named af after Patrick Pierce. Patrick Pierce was one of the 16 men who were executed by the British after the suppression of the Easter uprising. It may be pointed out that there is a coin, Irish coin, today bearing the image of Patrick Pierce. This other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive his nature seemed so daring and sweet his thought. These lines refer to Thomas MacDonagh, an important leader of the Easter uprising. Thomas MacDonagh was a lecturer in University College Dublin. He was a poet and a dramatist. And Yeats believes that he was a sensitive artist with a daring imagination. And had he lived long enough, he would have become a famous poet, a famous dramatist, a famous playwright. Like Patrick Pierce, Thomas Bactuna was also executed by the British for his role in the Easter Rebellion. This other man I had dreamed, a drunken, vainglorious lout, he had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart. Yet I number him in the song. He too has resigned his part in the casual comedy. He too has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. These are 
very interesting lines. They are about John McBride. John McBride was an Irish Republican leader, one of the important participants in the Easter uprising, and of course the husband of Montgomery. I think uh, John McBride was one of the very few participants in the Easter Rebellion who knew how to handle a gun. John McBride had taken part in the Second Anglo-Boer War in South Africa. The story goes that he was too well known a figure, he was too much under the observation of the British that the organizers of the Easter Uprising decided not to share the secrets of the organization of the rebellion with him and that John McBride found himself on the morning of the uprising in the middle of the uprising and agreed to take part in it. He was court-martialed after the uprising, he was court-martialed and shot by the British. Let us see what Yeats says about John McBride. This other man I had dreamed, something which I used to find difficult to explain. Why did the poet dream of John McBride? One explanation is that Yeats was always dreaming of Mud Gun, and also everything and everybody associated with Mud Gun, and so he must have dreamed of. John McBride as well, because John McBride was briefly the husband of Montgomery. This other man I had dreamed, yet drunken, vainglorious lout. A beautiful line, I love it. Drunken. It is true that John McBride had a drink problem. He was a very hard drinker. I don't know whether he can be called a drunkard, but he was a hard drinker. And his excessive alcoholism was one of the reasons for his problems with Montgomery, for his estrangement with Montgomery. How does the poet describe John McBride here? A drunken, vainglorious. Lovely word. It's an old word. Vainglorious man is someone who is very proud and who is ostentatious in his pride, who has excessive self-belief, excessive self-confidence, and who wants his glory to be emblazoned in the, uh, in the skies. An ostentatious seeker of glory, vainglorious, a drunken, vainglorious lout. Lout is a clumsy guy, an ill-mannered guy, an aggressive guy, an oaf. You must remember that the poet is jealous of John McBride. John McBride achieved what AIDS could not achieve. John McBride married Montgomery. And out of his jealousy, out of his bitterness, the poet describes John McBride as a drunken, vain, glorious, loud, uncouth guy, ill-mannered guy, clumsy fellow, drunkard. Vainglorious guy. He had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart. Marrying Mudgun. How can somebody be forgiven for marrying Mudgun? Then treating her badly. My God, they say he used to kick her. Unbearable. And finally, he, he got separated from Montgomery. I think my information is that, my understanding is that, my memory is that, 
they were not officially divorced, they were only separated officially. Can John McBride ever be forgiven? He had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart. When I read the poem for the first time, I think I was a schoolboy at that time. I wondered why the poet says to some who are near my heart. It would have been better if he says to one who is near my heart. But now I think I know the explanation. To some, Morgan and Morgan's daughter, Isult gone. Isult gone. The story goes that John McBride tried to molest Morgan's daughter, Isult gone. Yet I number him in the song, yet. Even, all, even after all this has happened, still, I mention him in this song. He too has resigned his part in the casual comedy. He too has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. The poet's point is that even a fool, a clown, a rogue, a drunkard, an oaf, a vainglorious fool like John McBride, good for nothing fellow. Even he, because of his heroic role in the Easter uprising, has transformed himself and he deserves mention in the poem, not only in the poem, in the annals of history. That is the magic of the uprising. That is the divine magic of the uprising. Even a worthless fellow, even a wretch, like John McBride, is converted into a hero, is transformed into a hero, is metamorphosed into a hero because of his participation in the Easter uprising. This is the divine magic of the Easter rebellion. I request you to attempt to work out a comparison between the lines under consideration and the lines from another famous poem of W.B. Yeats, A Prayer for My Daughter, which go thus, I quote, While that great queen that rose out of the spray, being fatherless, could have her way, Yet chose a bandy-legged smith for man. Unquote. These lines are about Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. Venus, being her Roman version. Aphrodite, Venus did not have to submit to the discipline of a father. But Aphrodite, Venus, chose the wrong man as husband, a bandy-legged smith for man, very ugly fellow with bandy legs, legs curving outward, clumsy guy. Aphrodite married Hephaestus. Venus married Vulcan. Who is Hephaestus? Vulcan. 
I think Hephaestus is the Greek version, while Vulcan is a Roman version. Extremely ugly god, god of fire, god of blacksmiths, god of metal work, god of metallurgy. Could not Aphrodite, could not Venus find a more appropriate husband? I think these lines are as much applicable to Modgon as they are to Aphrodite or Venus. Because Modgon did not have to submit to paternal control, paternal discipline. Modgon's father died early, leaving her an immense fortune. She could marry the person she wanted. And whom did she marry? A bandy-legged smith for man. Chose a bandy-legged smith for man. I think from the perspective of AIDS, the description bandy-legged smith very much suits John McBride. John McBride was ugly. He was a drunkard. He was a lout. He was bandy-legged. He was a wretch. He was an oaf. And he was quite familiar with the handling of guns. To that extent, I think he was like Vulcan Hephaestus. So you should try to work out a comparison between the lines in Easter 1916 and the lines in A Prayer for My Daughter in which he describes the marriage of Aphrodite or Venus as well as the marriage of Modgon to the most inappropriate idiot possible. I have to observe that what we get here in the lines about John McBride in the poem Easter 1916 is a rather prejudiced picture of John McBride, of the man. McBride was a man of tremendous qualities, but the qualities never came to be recognized for a number of reasons. The allegations that were made about John McBride by Mortgon, including the allegation that he molested Ishultgon, were made during divorce proceedings. And you must remember that in divorce proceedings, extremely wild allegations are flung at the rival parties. And the allegations made by Modgon were never proved in the divorce court. Further, John McBride's memory has been systematically defamed by the WBH's Modgon industry which churns out books, essays, articles, research papers year after year. And the authors of these generally take the words of the poet about John McBride at their face value. They treat the opinions of AIDS about John McBride as if they were proven facts. As I said, John McBride was a man of remarkable qualities, but for certain reasons, the qualities never ever came to be recognized. It is important, it is significant that Modgon herself was very unhappy about 
these lines about John McBride in Easter 1916. And that she wrote a letter to WB AIDS expressing her profound unhappiness. In that letter she pointed out that John McBride had entered eternity, had entered eternity through the great door of sacrifice. We have reached the penultimate stanza. Is a very powerful stanza. And reading the lines of the stanza often makes me cry. Hearts with one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. The horse that comes from the road, the rider, the birds that range from cloud to tumbling cloud, minute by minute they change. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. A horse hoof slides on the brim, and a horse splashes within it. The long-legged moo hens dive, and hens to moo cocks call. Minute by minute they live, the stones in the midst of all. When I did my post-graduation, I had to write a short note on the stone symbolism in Easter 1916. The stone symbolism in the penultimate stanza of Easter 1916 draws its sustenance from numerous sources. I shall pinpoint two such sources of inspiration for the stone symbolism. All over Ireland there are sacred stones. Scattered all over Ireland are stones which had been holy, which had been sacred to the pagans which had been looked upon as sacred before the arrival of Christianity and which had played a key role in the pagan religion that antedated the arrival of Christianity. Some of these stones, it was claimed, had been used as coronation thrones. Some of these stones, it, had, it was claimed, had been used as coronation thrones by mythical kings. Similarly, the stone is mentioned in a crucial passage in the Bible, in the New Testament. If I am not wrong, in Matthew 16:18. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, Thou art Peter. And on this rock, I shall build my church. The stone symbolizes strength, determination, willpower, dedication, commitment, a refusal to compromise, Hearts with one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone. What it says is very much applicable to most of the leaders of the uprising. I shall give you the example of Patrick Pierce. 
who in himself embodied the spirit of the rebellion. I have already said that as a boy of 10, Patrick Pierce used to kneel every night on his bed and seek from God the boon of being able to lay down his life for his motherland. Patrick Pierce had only one goal, one aim, one obsession, the freedom of Ireland. He never drank, he never smoked, he never relaxed socially, he never married. His prayers came true when in 1916 he was executed for his role in the Easter uprising. I am reminded of the Latin saying, dulce yet decorum, est pro patria mori. You can also say dulce, dulce yet decorum, est pro patria mori. It is sweet and glorious to die for one's homeland. I wonder whether W.B. Yeats is having his own example in mind while writing these lines. The leaders of the Easter Rebellion were monomaniacs. Monomaniacs living for the freedom of Ireland, ever willing to die for the freedom of Ireland. But so was AIDS. AIDS gave monomaniacal dedication to poetry, to the muse, and spent decade after decade as a penurious poet. Or perhaps he is having his relationship with Mordgon in mind while writing these lines. He gave absolute unconditional devotion to Mordgon. And the result was that he succeeded in ruining his life and also becoming a great poet. Perhaps I paused at the wrong place because this is what the poet says. Enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream, to trouble the living stream. Absolute dedication, unconditional dedication, monomaniacal dedication is remarkable, is praiseworthy. But there is something petrifying about it. There is something artificial about it. There is something death-like about it. That is why the poet says to trouble the living stream. Everything in life, everything in this world changes, moves, 
transforms itself, undergoes metamorphosis, movement, change, transformation are all signifiers of life. The refusal to change, the refusal to transform, the refusal to move is a symbol of death. Enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. I think Yeats is having in mind a stone, a rock in the middle of flowing water. In Sligo itself, there are numerous rocks in the middle of flowing streams and Yeats who saw Sligo as his spiritual home, as his paradise, who identified himself completely with Sligo, its nature, its history, its culture, its mythology is here making use of what he had seen and what had left an indelible mark in his mind as a child, a rock in the middle of flowing water. The flowing water stands for life because life is always flowing. Life is always moving. And in the middle of the flowing stream is the, is the stone. Years, decades, centuries of flowing water have not been able to move the stone even a little bit. While the flowing water symbolizes life, the stone symbolizes the dedication, symbolizes the dedication of the participants of the Easter uprising. The poet now tries to amplify on what he means by the term the living stream, the horse, the rider, the, the birds that move from one cloud to another cloud, the clouds themselves which keep moving, which keep falling, everything changes minute by minute. The horse that comes from the road, the rider, the birds that range from cloud to tumbling cloud, minute by minute they change. This is what the poet means by the term the living stream. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. Look at the shadows. Do they remain static? Do they remain still? Do they remain motionless? No. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. A horse hoof slides on the brim and a horse splashes within it. That is what you see when you look at the water. The water reflects what is happening by its side. The, the water of the stream reflects what is happening on the banks of the stream. The long-legged moo hens dive and hens to moor cocks call. The moor hen or the marsh hen is a medium-sized water bird. If my understanding is right, 
you can find more hens or marsh hens all over India, especially in summer. I have found them in my estate. I find them in my estate every summer. And uh, I don't know what I understand is I'm not sure. They are capable of migrating thousands of kilometers. The long-legged moor hens dive and hens to moor cocks call. Minute by minute they live. The stone is in the midst of all. What is the poet trying to say? Everything in this world changes. Everything in this world lives from minute to minute. And there is a stone in the midst of all this, unchanging, absolute, unmoving. The, the stone refuses to move, the stone refuses to change. It is in the middle of life, in the middle of this world. And everything in life and everything in this world keeps on changing, moving. There's something wrong with the stone, something death-like, something petrifying about the stone. And the stone symbolizes the absolute, unconditional dedication that the revolutionaries gave to the cause of the freedom of their motherland. Let us read the last stanza. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. O oh, when may it suffice that is heaven's part, our part, to murmur name upon name, as a mother names her child, when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it need this death? after all. For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know they dream enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse, MacDonough and McBride, and Connolly, and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. At the opening of the last answer, the poet declares that too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Sacrifice is great. Sacrifice is remarkable. Sacrifice is praiseworthy. But if it is excessive sacrifice, if it is unending sacrifice, it can make a stone of the heart. It has a petrifying effect on the individual who carries out the sacrifice. I wonder whether it is having only the leaders of the Easter rebellion in mind while uttering these lines. Is he not having his own example in mind as well? The unending sacrifice, the excessive sacrifice that he carried out as a result of his absolute unconditional devotion to Matgon. Did it not make a stone of his heart? Did it not 
destroy his personal life. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice? When will it be sufficient? When will the sacrifice be rewarded? When will the sacrifice be concluded? That is heaven's part. That is decided by God. That is decided by the Supreme. That is decided by the Divine. That is heaven's part. Nobody can say how much sacrifice will be sufficient. Look at what the revolutionaries did. The supreme sacrifice that they carried out. Has it been rewarded? No, not it. It is for the powers above to decide when the sacrifice is sufficient. What can we do? This is what the poet says. Our part to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. We have here the beautiful image, the homely image of the mother repeating the name of the child while rocking the cradle and ensuring that the child goes to sleep. The name of the child is the most sweet, the most precious name that a, that a mother can utter. To murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. The child spends the entire day in wild activity, in excessive activity. And by the time it is night, the child is completely tired. The mother rocks the cradle, repeating the name of the child, the sweetest name, the most precious name that she can utter. And the child goes to sleep. This is precisely what has happened here. The revolutionaries are indeed the children of Mother Ireland. And there was something childlike about their innocence. There was something childlike in their inability to understand the complexities of the political reality of the day. There was something childlike in their faith in themselves and in their destiny. And now all that we can do is to repeat their names. Just as a mother, very lovingly, very sweetly, very tenderly, repeats the name of her child and rocks the cradle and sends the child to sleep. The leaders of the uprising have gone to sleep. But it is more than mere sleep. It is eternal sleep. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night but death. The child goes to sleep at night. But here the child has gone to sleep and will never ever awake. 
the child is dead. Was it needless death? After all, that is what the poet asks. Was it necessary for the revolutionaries to do what they did and to court death? To create a situation in which they would be court-martialed and executed because the English had passed the Home Rule Bill in 1913. which envisaged home rule for Ireland. But the act was not implemented because of the outbreak of the First World War. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith. Why should we think that the English would not keep their word? Why should we think that the English will not carry out their promise? For England may very well keep faith. If that is the case, all this was unnecessary. The uprising, the bloodshed, the court marshalling, the execution. Very clearly the, the ambivalent attitude of the poet is expressed through these lines. Please understand, please realize that the poet does not try to lionize the participants in the uprising. He is ready to give them their due, but he asks a very valid question. Was all this really necessary? Would not have Ireland become a free nation after the conclusion of the First World War? Would it not have been better if the Irish revolutionaries had displayed a little more patience? These are all the questions which are not asked directly, but which are implicit in the lines. For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. Usually we say said and done. All is said and done means everything considered. But here I think the poet reverses the structure for the sake of maintaining his rhyme scheme. When everything is considered, when all is said and done, England may keep faith. If that is so, it raises a huge question mark over various aspects of the Easter uprising. We know they dream enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? The poet says, we know what the dream was. The dream was a free Ireland. The dream was the ending of the colonial yoke. The dream was an Irish Republic free from British control or English control. We know the dream. And we know that they are dead. They are no longer alive. We know that it was because they attempted to convert their dream into reality that they died. We know that they died because of their dream, for their dream, for the sake of the dream. 
We know they dream, and after now they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? Here the poet touches upon a great fundamental truth. When you love excessively, when you love beyond all limits, you lose a sense of balance, you lose a sense of proportion, your grip over reality weakens. The object of your love may be your may be your partner. The object of your love may be your child. The object of your love may be your estate. The object of your love may be your religion. The object of your love may be your community. The object of your love may be your political party. The object of your love may be your profession. The object of your love may be your hobby. Whatever it be, if you love excessively, you are likely to become irrational. That is precisely what happened to the revolutionaries. They loved their motherland so much that their grip over reality weakened. They were bewildered, they were puzzled, they were confused, they were nonplussed. Look at all those things that they did. A few hundred men and women, mostly untrained, wretchedly armed, trying to overthrow the might of the British Empire. Can anything be more insane than this? They did this because they were bewildered, because they loved Ireland so much that they lost their sense of balance. They lost their grip over reality. What if excess of love bewildered them till they died? We now come to the grand finale of the poem. I write it out in a verse, MacDonough and MacBride, and Connolly and Pierce. Now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. The poet now decides to mention some of the important leaders of the uprising. MacDonough. MacDonough is, of course, Thomas MacDonough. We have already met him. He is mentioned in the second stanza. Thomas MacDonough was lecturer in University College Dublin. McBride, we have already met him. He is John McBride, the separated husband of Maud Gone. Pierce, Patrick Pierce, founder of St. Yenda's School and perhaps the greatest leader of the Easter Rebellion. Connolly is of course James Connolly, the trade union leader and socialist who was badly injured in the uprising and was taken to the spot of his execution in a stretcher. According to some 
versions. Partly he was also he was also wheelchaired to the spot of his execution. Now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. The poet says that all these people, the leaders of the uprising, the participants in the uprising, now and in time to be, now and forever, not just now, now and for all time. Wherever green is worn, green is the color of the Irish nationalist movement, the color of the, the Irish nationalists. It can even be said that green is the color of Ireland, for after all, Ireland is Emerald Isle. As long as there is Irish nationalism, even as long as there is Ireland, they are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. The poet's point is that by taking part in the Easter uprising, the participants in the rebellion, who had been very ordinary persons to begin with, have been transformed into heroes. All changed, changed utterly, are changed, changed utterly. Those who took part in the uprising are changed completely. They who had been ordinary persons have now become heroes. In fact, even John McBride, a drunkard, an oaf, an idiot, the rascal, the villain who dared to marry Modgon, even he has become a hero. The Easter uprising has generated a terrible beauty. A terrible beauty is born. The beauty of the Easter uprising is the beauty of revolution. The beauty of violence. The, blue, the beauty of bloodbath. the beauty of sacrifice, the beauty of death. April is the fourth month of the year. And this poem, titled Easter 1916, which titularly is about a festival which falls in April is organized in four stanzas. If you read the poem carefully, you find a very significant shift in the attitude of the poet as the poem moves from the first stanza to the last stanza. In the first stanza, the poet says that The leaders of the rebellion, the participants in the Easter uprising, were only casual acquaintances of his. In fact, he used to make fun of them. He used to mock them in order to please some companion of his at the United Arts Club in Dublin. But by the time the fourth stanza is reached, the speaker is prepared to name the leaders of the rebellion as a mother names her child. There is a very significant movement 
in the attitude of the speaker towards the revolutionaries as the poem progresses from the first stanza to the fourth stanza. But even in the fourth stanza, the poet refuses to identify himself completely with the rebels, with the cause which the rebels fought for and died for. The poet asks, was it needless death after all? The ambivalent attitude of the poet, of the speaker, becomes clear here. On the one hand, he accepts that they were great patriots, that they were dreamers, that they loved their motherland excessively. On the other hand, he asks whether what they did is justifiable. What they did was something which was required. Was it needless death after all? The ambivalent attitude of the speaker towards the uprising and the participants in the uprising. In the collected poems of W.B. Yeats, the date given is September the 25th, 1916. This is the date on which the poem was completed. But you must remember that the poem was begun in May, shortly after the uprising. Shortly after the uprising came to an end. And as in the case of any typical Yeats poem, the poem went through numerous drafts. And the poet spent hours, days on it, polishing it up, improving, correcting. And the result is Easter 1916, as it appears before us today. I would like to analyze the stylistic component of the poem. But before that, I would like to say a word or two about the important themes dealt with in the poem. Some years back, I saw a question paper which asked the students to write a short note on the theme of Easter 1916. Easter 1916 is not a poem with just one theme. To say that Easter 1916 has only one theme is like saying that the sea has only one wave. I shall try to touch the most important themes handled in Easter 1916. First of all, there is the theme of relationship. The dividing line between acquaintance and friend. The dividing line between acquaintance and companion. There is the theme of passion. especially the passion of patriotism. The poem throws brilliant light on the power of an incident, on the power of an event to bring about a radical change, an overwhelming transformation. As in the case of many a typical Yeats poem, Easter 1916 deals with the theme of fine women. I am reminded of the lines in another 
extremely well-known poem of W.B. Yeats, A Prayer for My Daughter. Let me quote from memory. It's certain that fine women eat a crazy salad with their meat, whereby the horn of plenty is undone, uncut. In the present poem, the poet seems to believe that fine women should not engage in politics at least in extremist politics, and that extremist politics is capable of ruining fine women until they are fine no longer. The theme of rivalry in love is indirectly alluded to in the poem, the bitterness, the bitter outburst that we find in the poem against John McBride is unjustified and can be understood only when we realize that W.B. Yeats and John McBride were rivals in love. the theme of dedication and the power of dedication to achieve things that cannot be normally achieved and also the cost of dedication, the petrifying nature of dedication, the contrast between life and death between movement and stillness, between change and changelessness, the theme of the relationship between mother and child, or the theme of the relationship between mother and children, the dream, and the power of the dream the magical power of the dream and finally the theme of immortality, the theme of death, the theme of bloodshed, the theme of violence, the theme of destruction and above all the theme of immortality. How it is possible to survive the annihilation of death. What I have given you is not an exhaustive list, but it is certainly a comprehensive list. Henceforth, nobody should say that Easter 1916 has only one theme. The poem has a very appropriate title. The titles of the poems of W.B. Yeats are always appropriate, always justifiable. In the present case, the title perfectly matches the body of the poem. Easter 1916. We have already discussed the title in some detail, but there are a couple of things which, which I would like to say now. As is obvious, the title refers to the incidents that took place during the Easter week of 1916, the uprising that took place in Dublin mainly, but also in various parts of Ireland. 
But as I have already pointed out, Easter is arguably the oldest and the most sacred festival of the Christian churches. It was a pagan festival to begin with, a pagan festival of regeneration. Thus it is possible to read a secondary meaning to the title of the poem. In the Christian context, Easter celebrates the resurrection of Christ. It is true that the Easter uprising of 1916 ended as a fiasco. It is true that it was nothing more than an abortive attempt to free Ireland from the colonial yoke. But it is equally true or even more true that the uprising succeeded in reviving the fortunes of the struggle of Ireland for freedom, for freedom from the British imperialistic yoke. It can be argued that if the Easter rebellion had not taken place, the granting of freedom to Ireland could possibly have been delayed further. Because though the rebellion ended as a fiasco, it convinced the British of the difficulties of holding on to Ireland and ultimately hastened the granting of freedom to Ireland. It is sometimes said that Easter 1916 is an elegy. It is a poem solemn in tone which speaks of the death the, the death of the participants in the rebellion. It specifically mentions the important martyrs who laid down their their lives, who laid down their lives for the cause of Ireland's freedom. It is even possible to detect an elegiac tone in certain parts of the poem, especially in the last stanza of the poem. However, I would state that Easter 1916 is more a political poem than an elegy because the poem refuses to mourn for the dead. The poem refuses to lament the martyrdom of the participants in the rebellion. On the other hand, the poem attempts to immortalize them the poem attempts to demonstrate that by dying for their motherland, the martyrs like Patrick Pierce, like Thomas MacDonough, like John McBride, have actually gone beyond death and become immortal. So strictly speaking, Easter 1916 is not, is not an elegy. The poem is organized in four stanzas. You must remember that Easter falls in April and April is the fourth month of the year. The stanzas are of varying length. In fact, there is a very strict pattern which is followed by the poet. 
the first answer and the third stanza consist of 16 lines each while the second stanza and the last stanza the fourth stanza comprise 24 lines each I repeat the first answer runs into 16 lines the second stanza 24 lines the third stanza 16 lines and the fourth stanza 24 lines this stanzaic pattern and linear organization provides a sense of perfect balance to the poem. The rhyme scheme followed in the poem is AB AB and the poet makes use of both full rhymes and half rhymes. The rhyme scheme provides the poem with a balladic feel. We feel that we are listening to some folk lyric. And this balladic feel is strengthened by the fact that the lines are generally not very long. The lines are quite short. The poet makes use of iambic trimeter, mostly iambic trimeter. Occasionally, the poet makes use of trochee. An iambic trimeter is a line which consists of three feet, trimeter. An iamb is a foot consisting of two syllables. The first syllable is short. The following syllable is long. The first syllable is unstressed. The following syllable is stressed. In Trauki, the pattern is reversed. The long syllable or stressed syllable is followed by a short syllable or an unstressed syllable as in the case of a typical Yeats poem the imagery is sharp and indelible we get evocative pictures of Dublin the most important city in Ireland with its rows of Georgian houses glimpses of the graceful atmosphere in the United Arts Club of Dublin among whose founders had been Countess Marke Witz and WB Yeats. Images from the aristocratic pastime of hunting. Images from classical mythology. Images from natural life especially the natural life of rural Ireland with its water bodies, its streams, its birds, its horses, its water birds, images from family life. It is said of Jesus in the Bible that he never spoke 
except in parables. Matthew 13, 34. I think, while reading the poetry of W.B. Yeats, we can say that he, meaning Yeats, never spoke except through symbols. Yeats is one of the greatest symbolists in English poetry. And I have received quite a few requests on WhatsApp asking me to discuss Yeats as a symbolist in some detail. That is certainly a beautiful topic, a topic which frequently appears in question papers. But I feel this is not the opportune point to discuss the contribution of AIDS as a symbolist. I would like to devote an independent class, maybe not a very long class, but an independent class to the topic. For now, I shall content myself with identifying the most important symbols in Easter 1916. Certainly, the most important symbol is the stone that we meet with in the penultimate stanza of the, of the poem. The stone stands in the midst of flowing water. The stone is unlike the flowing water, not only unlike the flowing water, unlike everything else around it. Unlike all of nature, unlike the horse, the rider, the birds, the clouds, the moor hens, the moor cocks, in fact, unlike everything. The stone stands for determination, commitment, refusal to compromise. Dedication, devotion, monomaniacal passion. There is something remarkable about the stone. There is something praiseworthy about the stone. But it has to be accepted that the way of the stone is certainly not the way of life. There is something petrifying about the stone, something death-like about the stone, something unnatural about the stone. And in the particular context of the poem, the stone signifies the monomaniacal devotion that the rebels gave to their motherland. An important symbol that we meet with in the last, the very last few lines of the poem, I think it is the third last line of the poem, is the color green. Green is the color of the nationalist, nationalists, the Irish nationalists. Green is also the color of Ireland, for after all, Ireland is the Emerald Isle. Green is the color of nature. 
Green is the color of life. Green is the color of regeneration. Green is the color of revival. Green is the color of youth. I think all these aspects are woven into the symbolism of green in the poem. We have other symbols too. The symbol of motley. Motley is a multicolored dress worn by the clown, by the joker, by the buffoon. Motley can also mean a disparate group, an incongruous group. Motley symbolizes the entire age in which the poet, not just the poet, the rebels as well, the participants in the uprising as well, are destined to live. It is a symbol borrowed from the stage, the theatre. We have the symbol of the mother in the penultimate stanza. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. In the very last stanza, the mother putting the child to sleep, the mother rocking the cradle of the child, the mother repeating the name of the child, the sweetest name that she can imagine. The mother stands for Mother Ireland, whose children, the participants in the Easter rebellion, have given her unwavering devotion and have gone to sleep. At the end of the day, after hectic activity, but unfortunately, but sadly, this sleep is eternal sleep. This sleep is death. There is the symbol of the stream, the living stream as AIDS puts it. The stream symbolizes life. The stream symbolizes nature. The stream symbolizes time. The stream symbolizes movement. The stream symbolizes change. In the present poem, AIDS uses enjambment more frequently than usual. Enjambment means incomplete syntax at the end of a line. Enjambment is a movement of meaning and momentum from one line to the next line. I shall give you an example. In the very first answer, look at the second line, the third line and the fourth line. Coming with vivid faces from. Coming with vivid faces from. There is a continuation. Counter or desk among grey 18th century houses. Grey 18th century houses. Again there is continuation. The repeated use of enjambment speeds up the flow of the poem and makes it more fast paced. The opposite of enjambment is cisura. Cisura is a break, cisura is a pause between words, inside the ambit of a line. 
We meet with Sisura in the penultimate stanza. For example, that is heaven's part, our part. There's a pause after the first part. That is heaven's part, our part to murmur name upon name. Similarly, a few lines later, We know they dream enough. We know they dream enough. So there is a pause after dream. We know they dream enough to know they dreamed and are dead. Synecdoche is the figure of speech in which the part stands for the whole. The part represents the whole. We come across synecdoche in the third stanza. Hearts with one purpose alone. At the very beginning of the third stanza. Hearts with one purpose alone. The hearts are not hearts in a literal sense. But they represent individuals. They represent persons. Similarly in the fourth stanza. On limbs that had run wild. The limbs are not limbs in a literal sense. They represent the child. It is the child which has run wild, not the limbs. The poet makes lavish use of alliteration and assonance giving the poem an incantatory magic. Examples of alliteration are so sensitive his nature seemed in the second stanza a terrible beauty is born which is repeated several times in the poem, to know they dreamed and are dead in the last stanza of the poem. Examples of assonance include coming with vivid faces and a shadow of cloud. There is a beautiful Simile, in the last stanza of the poem, the speaker says that the role that has been assigned to him is the role of naming the rebels. It is not for him to say when the sacrifice of the rebels will be sufficient. When the sacrifice of the rebels will be rewarded. All that he can do is to repeat the names of the participants in the uprising. Our part to murmur name upon name. And he now uses a striking simile, a very homely simile, a very beautiful simile, which is also a very striking simile. He compares this activity, the activity of the speaker, in naming the, part, the, the participants in the uprising with the mother naming her child, rocking her child to sleep by repeating the name of the child. Our part to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. A refrain is a line or a group of lines, a line which is repeated or a group of lines which is repeated at regular intervals in a poem. Easter 1916 has 
a very carefully crafted refrain. A terrible beauty is born. This line is repeated again and again in the poem in order to strengthen its incantatory effect. An oxymoron is a figure of speech in which the two components, the two parts, contradict each other. A terrible beauty is certainly a powerful oxymoron. It is also very appropriate to the context in which it is used. Because the beauty that the poet has in mind is a frightening beauty, is a beauty filled with horror, the beauty of violence, the beauty of rebellion, the beauty of bloodshed, the beauty of death. It has to be observed that Easter 1916 is not the only political poem of W.B. Yeats. Perhaps it is the most famous political poem. But the fact is that Yeats has written quite a few political poems, including 16 Dead Men, The Rouse Tree, On a Political Prisoner, The Leaders of the Crowd, and A Meditation in Time of War. By the way, it may be pointed out that W. H. Auden was inspired by Easter 1916 to write his famous poem on the outbreak of the Second World War titled September 1, 1939. I would like to sign off by quoting the Sanskrit dictum which one is constantly reminded of while reading Easter 1916. Jenani Jenma Bhumischa Surgada Bigariyasi The mother and the motherland are more glorious than heaven.